Well, actually, it's not every element, really, but most of the elements, I think. Uh, in the in the early days, for instance, in the, at the time of uh, the trilogy and Opus Nocturne, I was doing uh, the screenplay. I was uh, directing, of course, and um, I used to get visual ideas for sets and things like that. I did my own casting because yes. I had very clear ideas of the kind of actors that I wanted for certain parts. I did my own casting, and then uh, at the time of editing, I didn't operate the camera at that time, and I didn't write the music. Uh, at the time of editing also, I was there, very much there. The films were more or less, uh, as the expression goes, cut in the camera, so there wasn't a great deal left for the editor to do, but of course I've had a very creative editor helping me. But later on, for instance, I took over operating. <coughs> uh, since when? Since uh, the time of Charulotta. You see, I decided that the uh, camera, it was through the camera that one was able to judge uh, the action and the movement of the actors best, rather than sitting in a chair by the side. And uh, I found it helped the actors also, because uh, uh, I was behind the camera, you know, they, they couldn't see me actually, uh, and uh, it, it helped them, they felt easier. And in the early days I worked with, uh, on music, I worked with professional I wouldn't say professional composers, but professional mus musicians. I mean, I worked with Ravi Shankar on uh, four of my films. But they were essentially instrumentalists. They were performers, concert performers. Uh, they were not trained film composers. So that, uh, they, for instance, they were not trained to write music which would run for two minutes and seven seconds and things like that, you see. So uh, it was always a problem working, although they were very inventive, Ravi Shankar in particular uh, devised some beautiful music for the trilogy and uh, I was very happy to use them, but uh, the method that I used was that he, they would come, maybe just for a day or a couple of days, they would be, the rest of the time they were touring all over the world, if not all over India, and they would be available for, let us say, two days or three days, and which time they would probably have one look at the film, not even the whole film, for instance, Ravi Shankar saw only half of Patek Manchali, and they would write certain specific pieces, and the rest of the time, I was interested more in using their instruments. I was interested in Ravi Shankar's sitar, I was interested in Ali Akbar Sarod, and interested in certain ragas which I knew would fit certain situations. So I had them perform maybe for three minutes, four minutes at a stretch, various ragas in various moods and various tempos. And later on it meant a tremendous lot of work in the cutting room for me, trying to fit the music uh, with the scenes. So finally, in uh, around 1960, at the time of Teen Konna, I decided to do my own music. So more and more I felt that I needed, uh, for instance, when you are doing a theme which is uh, concerned with urban, uh, the contemporary urban yes. society, you can't uh, use conventional classical Indian mus instruments like the sitar and so on. They just don't, don't go with the theme. So I decided to use a combination of Western and Eastern uh, instruments and uh, my, I had always been interested in Western music and uh, I was also familiar with the Western style of notation. So I decided, and since I was getting too many ideas of my own, it, it's, always, it's not always very um, satisfactory to have to dictate great musicians like Vilayat Khan and Ali Akbar, so I, and it threatened our friendship on a personal level, so I decided to do it on my own. And now more and more I use uh, less and less music, I find, because I can use the uh, mixing facilities have improved and I can use a more creative soundtrack, whereby one can use actual sounds uh, almost as you use music to suggest moods and things like that. In a, in a city story, you can, if it's, you can use in a Calcutta story in John Orono, actually the city itself provided the, the noise of traffic and uh, that sort of thing. And uh, it's provided the, 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 the mood building soundtrack, you know, in Oshani Shanket, which one could well have used folk music in abundance. But I prefer to use bird noises, I prefer to use the sound of dinky, you know, right. that sort of thing. And I prefer to use um, wind noises and, 
extraneous, other extraneous, I used uh, one particular bird, the woodpecker, which I recorded. I was lucky to be able to record one. And it comes at a very crucial point uh, when uh, Moti dies. You know, at that point, when she's lying on the ground with her eyes, staring eyes, and hold the Moti? camera for about five, six, Moti? seven seconds on that face, uh, oh, we can hear the woodpecker going, which is a very shrill, rather alarming kind, of rather eerie sort of sound. And uh, I thought, uh, I felt that use of music would sentimentalize the scene, so I decided to use this, which was also a realistic sound, as well as a kind of a stylization of sound. Sir. Well, actually, I uh, started using professionals fairly early on, if you remember, uh, because after Pater Marcello and Oporizito came uh, Porosh Pater and... Uh, you had? Jol Chakar. Tulsi Chakraborty. So I had uh, used Chul Tulsi Chakraborty and I had used Chobi Biswas. Chobi Biswas was a very, very special case because he was really a very, very big professional actor at that time, probably the biggest character actor in, on the Bengali screen of that period. And I had uh, some problems in the early stages, like for instance in Jol Chakar, uh, in the portions which show uh, show him as a young man. He insisted on doing his own makeup. Being a newcomer, a comparative newcomer, and being new to Chobi Biswas, I, I couldn't do anything about it. So uh, all that portion which shows him as a young man remains uh, a very theatrical sort of makeup. That, that stays uh, in the film as a blemish. But uh, I got used to Chobi Babu very, and he got used to me uh, in a very short time. And when I made, a sec made the second film with him, Debbie, he was so cooperative and he... So one uses uh, different methods with different actors. One with professionals, one with professionals who are competent, Another method with professionals who are not so competent, where you handle them almost as uh, amateurs, that has happened too. And a third method with newcomers who are talented, and a fourth method with new newcomers who are not talented, whom I cast uh, for their face and uh, voice, perhaps, just for those, these two qualities uh, which uh, fit a certain character. And yet a fifth method, fifth and sixth methods, fifth with gifted children and the sixth method with not so gifted children. So I have used all kinds and I still keep on using all these six methods uh, for my uh, actors. If an actor uh, has a very, very large part, like for instance Opu in the trilogy, or let us say uh, Pratik Dandi, the main actor, who is throughout there, throughout the film, or with Chabu, Chabu Babu in Jal Shagar, and in many of these films, where, uh, the, the, which are dominated by one or two or three characters, I usually, uh, they're naturally given the script well beforehand, so they have time to learn their lines. And in addition to that, if they show an interest in discussing the part with me, uh, to find out the motivations, to be more clear about how it should be played. I'm perfectly willing to oblige them, and I do that. We have sessions with, I have had sessions with various actors. If uh, it has happened in uh, not many cases, uh, because I started uh, with Dead Authors, uh, and uh, the first living author that I, uh, that was Parashuram, and when I uh, pre had prepared a treatment, I went and saw him and told him what kind of little sort of inventions, uh, inventions of my own that I was going to put into the film. And he was terribly excited and very, very happy. And uh, with Tara Shankar, it was a different experience because I told Tara Shankar Babu that I had, uh, I would like to make a film of Jal Shagar. He said, all right, I'll do the screenplay for you. And I said, well, certainly. Uh, I would love you, to, it would be wonderful if you could do the treatment. Then he started doing a treatment. And when he had finished about three chapters, I found that he was writing an original story, completely original story, which had almost nothing to do with the short story. So I said, no, Tarashankur Babu, I'm interested in your short story, so let me do a treatment. So that was that. But I never had a chance to discuss with him after the film opened what he thought of the film. But then I've discussed the films with, uh, with uh, projects with Narendranath Mitra, for instance. He entirely approved of um, uh, Mahanagar. 
and uh, by and large Shankar has approved of his treatments but I think an actor really would ideally prefer uh, a literal translation of their stories and uh, there I can sense that there is a certain element of dissatisfaction in, even in their approval I have noticed that but that's, this doesn't apply to all the writers that I'm uh, thinking of for instance Shunil didn't like his version of in my version of Oranidin Ratri, but he wholeheartedly approved of all the changes that I made in uh, the next film that I did, Prati uh, Dandi. Uh, and, uh, well, this has been more or less the case. It's not that one once once makes changes because just for the fun of it, or, I mean, it's, it's one usually has a much more serious reason for it. And I personally can't think of a single instance of even a classic which has been translated successfully uh, into cinema uh, as being totally unchanged from its original uh, form because a writer, an author doesn't write for, uh, with the film medium in mind at all and I think certain changes are inevitable. I had to make uh, certain uh, rather significant changes, for instance at the end of Postmaster, the girl Little Rotten falls at the feet of the postmaster and uh, sort of says, beseeches with him not to go away or at least take her with him. But I felt that um, it was a bit Victorian. It might sort of spill over on the screen. It might seem over emotional or sentimental. So I, I had her suffer. I had her go through these pangs of, uh, you know, I mean, through to the same emo emotion of suffering without actually having her fall at his feet. You know, those changes one has to make. No, for instance, when my, well, there are certain things that are dictated by circumstances. For instance, when one makes a film about contemporary Calcutta, one would, one should ideally shoot on location in actual interiors. And this is, this is something which happens in, uh, abroad all the time because nowadays, for instance, the new wave people, all the French uh, directors, they have practically stopped building sets. They all work on location in actual interiors, apartment interiors, out in the streets. But the environment there is different. Here, shooting on location in a city, urban location, is, can be hell, absolutely. I have had this experience many, many times. But streets, we cannot build in the studio. So we have willy-nilly to shoot in the streets, no matter how many thousands of people uh, gather to watch and get in the way of your work. But interiors, I find, because in order to avoid the problem, uh, the, the problem of dubbing, of post-synchronizing the dialogue, which I always find is a very mechanical process. I prefer to build interiors in the studio because I think I have sufficiently imaginative and clever art directors who will be able to simulate reality. And I have a sufficiently intelligent and uh, uh, mature cameraman to simulate actual light, right lighting, uh, available lighting. And uh, our interior studio interiors have fooled uh, many of the best foreign critics I have spoken to them. They can hardly ever make out which is, which is actual set or which is actual interior. So this has been the case and uh, this is, as I told you, this is dictated by circumstances. But if a film is laid entirely on location, like for instance Kanchenjunga, which was planned to be shot in Darjeeling, uh, entirely outdoors, taking into account the changes of weather that takes place in Darjeeling and the whole story, I spent a few uh, a fortnight or so there and observed how the weather keeps changing there. And the whole story was planned to take into account of rising mists, mists disappearing and the sun coming out, the clouds covering the sun and the gradual uh, falling of light from four o'clock to six o'clock, which is the running time of the film. The very special type of film where the changes of mood uh, were dictated by the changes of actual atmospheric mm -hmm. conditions. I think of myself primarily as a storyteller, as a maker of fiction films. But I have, uh, on 
occasions, on the occasions when I uh, made documentaries, they were on subjects which, which fascinated me, which really drew me, uh, which uh, inspired me, let us say. First, there was a film on Rabindranath for the centenary, and the film on Binod Bihari Mukherjee, who was my art teacher in Shantiniketan, a remarkable man as well as a remarkable painter, and um, a film on Bala Saraswati, which was a tribute to a great dancer. But I would like to make more short story films, there's no question of that, because we do have a very rich fund of uh, filmable short, short stories, stories which should not be expanded. There are a few things which haven't been done yet. For instance, I've always wanted to do an epic. I've been fascinated by the Mahabharata and I'm still fascinated by Mahabharata, but I don't think the whole of Mahabharata can be tackled. So perhaps a segment of an epic, a segment of Mahabharata I'd do using our tradition of stylization, perhaps using the Kathakali. I really haven't got a very clear notion of what I want to do, but I definitely do want to do an epic, a story which everybody knows from beforehand. That is something which I want to do. One is, one, I think one can make a film on the dice game itself. Just the dice game can make uh, an entire film. The main problem with Mahabharata is the, the characters. I mean, one has, if one thinks of an Indian audience, then there's no problem, because everybody knows who Karno is and who Bisho is, etc. But uh, I'm afraid a film of this nature has to be planned for the world market. Mm. Uh, and there, the relationship of the characters, yeah. tremendous Absolutely. problem. Because unless you address a person as uncle, for instance, at least three times, he's not uncle. I mean, you, mm. this is one of the things, one of the things that one learns over the years. That, and perhaps I would lo do, like to do a folk tale at some point. Very much I'd like to do a f an authentic folk tale, not a uh, guppy guy, but an authentic folk tale, perhaps based on a moment Shingitika uh, ballad in a very, very simple, very, very simple style with very, very f little dialogue, but using, again, uh, Bengali folk forms. I'll continue to make children's films from time to time, that I know, I have decided to do that. And perhaps an English language film involving Indians, because, you see, if you have uh, people of different provinces uh, getting together in a situation. English is the only lingo that they can use. And that kind of uh, English language film, where in the, the language itself would be used creatively, maybe one person will be very difficult, uh, we're, we're very sort of uh, unvocal because of his lack of command of the language. Another would be very fluent, another would use a certain strong Indian accent. That sort of a situation. I, it's still uh, very much at the back of my mind, but I don't know what so there are still a few. Have yes, indeed, it? I was forgetting about that. That I would very much like to do, but the, again, that is a question of resources, technical resources. Mm -hmm. Because now, uh, Kubrick's 2001 and a few other films made since then have set such a high standard. Yeah, There's actually. no question of making that kind of a mm -hmm. science fiction film mm -hmm. here in Bengal. But the idea that I had uh, originally was more of a metaphysical sort of science fiction film does not, would not involving so much technical expertise and perfection. Perhaps I, oh, that, that is one thing I would love to do at some point. Well, actually, <coughs> Durdarshan had asked me to do uh, first a series of short stories, then of course we decided that we can start with one. And so I started looking for a short story in Hindi because since this was to be for All India um, screening, therefore uh, I decided on uh, looking for a Hindi story. And naturally I started reading uh, Prem Chant. I knew uh, quite a number of Prem Chant stories. Uh, I had read them in translations before. But this time I found uh, a fairly large volume of short stories published by, I think it was part of the UNESCO translation scheme and I got the book, I read the stories, and I found Sadgati Deliverance, which is called Deliverance in English, in that book. And it struck me as a remarkably uh, fine story and very, very filmic story, and dealing with a problem, which, uh, of course, I found fascinating. But both, I mean, one looks not just for a form or an effective structure, but also for, for, for a theme, I think one, uh, and this is a story which combined both 
extremely effectively. Uh, it's, when I say that it's a perfect story, of course I mean primarily that it's perfect for filming. I mean, it's very cinematic. But at the same time, I felt that it was dealing with a problem which, which uh, concerned me, which, which, uh, which, which I, I, was, I found uh, that I uh, was very, very interested in. And uh, uh, it was very it treated extremely effectively. And it also had um, to do with what was uh, happening now. Although it was a story which was written some, something like 50 years ago or 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, but it still uh, is uh, contemporary. I mean, one has to think of the slot. For instance, uh, I was told that the story would uh, had better be around 50 minutes uh, long. And so I had to keep that in mind. There was no question of uh, treating it in a, in a very free fashion. I had to keep the length in mind all the time. And it just so happens that the story uh, falls within that, that slot very easily. And uh, even the first cut turned out to be about 50, 49, 48, 50 minutes long. So it's, uh, I was lucky from that point of view because it's a story that lends itself to that uh, kind of treatment. Well, I would say that I made very, very little changes. I, I wrote maybe, I wrote in a, a scene, uh, it was hinted at in the original uh, scene between uh, the Brahmin and a couple of chaps, also Brahmin, who come to him for advice. Um, uh, I think Prem Chand merely mentions that these, uh, the Brahmin was having a conversation with, with some people uh, in, the, in, the, in the veranda, but uh, I wanted a scene with dialogue. And that was entirely uh, written for the treatment, for the film. Otherwise, um, the story follows the original, the film follows the original very, very closely, remarkably closely. And when people talk of the effectiveness of the last scene where the Brahmin sprinkles holy water, etc., etc., that is precisely uh, described in exactly the same way in, in the original and the dragging of the dead body, and the death of, of, of Dukhi. Uh, everything is there in the original. I have not really dealt with the rural theme properly yet. I mean, Sadgati marks a beginning, perhaps, uh, uh, of that level of society. And I would definitely like to do more.